Eternal God, our Father, we are so grateful that you have blessed us to be present today, Lord. Not only physically present, but mentally and spiritually present. And Father, we pray that you will speak into our lives and give us the joy unspeakable that's full of your glory. Father, thank you for being faithful, and we pray that you will place your word in our hearts that we might be fruitful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.
I, I like that. You like that? Did you sing with them? I don't think you did. I felt very alone. <laughs> That's a good song. I like that. And I would like to personally say, I miss the choir so much. <laughs> we had marvelous music. Thank you, Mark, all through the August. It was marvelous. But there they are, those blessed saints. Thank you that you are back. Okay. Now, let's see. What else? Do oh, I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. This is not to throw away. This is to read and, and do two things. First, we realize how blessed we are in this country. We don't have somebody trying to burn down the chapel. But all over the world, our brothers and sisters in Christ are hurting. And they sure are braver than I am right now. It's burned down. They come back. They build it. And that is with the power of Christ that they do that. So please pray. And then pray for them. And then next of all, I, I use this list. It comes out at the beginning of the month. And this is who you pray for every day. And I don't know about you, but I have to have structure in my prayer life. I sit there and I thank God for a million things. I pray for my family. But it's better with this there. So this will give you a starting place. And then you may jump off and pray for a whole bunch of other things. Is that okay, Bill? Is that a good thing? Bill's going, oh yeah, oh yeah. I like it when Bill goes, oh yes. Now I want to talk about something else here. I'm going to get a little bit personal. I'm going to, you're going to learn more about me than you probably want to know. Too much information. But I just wanted to have you think about something. So I'm going to ask you a question. What if you inv had invited someone to occupy a guest room in your house? That you had a room? You invited them in to stay there. You had heard that this guest was wonderfully wise and kind and generous. Well, who wouldn't want a guest like that? A lover of people of all ages and abilities whose joy in life was helping others to become all they could be. Well, that sounds like somebody we'd want in our home. And no charge and always available to be helpful to you in ever, whatever way you needed. Wouldn't you want to invite that person and have them living there in your home? You know, and, and many of our, my friends had said and talked about this person and recommended them and said that, that this guest had brought peace to their life and guided them into what was true and had even given them wise counsel as they navigated the difficulties of life. And I also heard that this guest in their home had had a tremendous influence on them, but an influence that seemed to transform them from the inside out. And so they didn't have to work at it. They just became a better, more loving person without even having to think about it. Now there's something I could go for. Their family and friends had remarked on this. This sounded good to me, to, to you, and you invited the guest into the back room. You closed the door and you went right on with your life. You never went back there and got to know that friend, that guest. You never found out what they wanted to do for you, to be in your life. That doesn't make sense, does it? To ignore the guest. Well, that was me in my 30s. I was married. I had three Exhausting boys, wonderful boys, and the house rocked with all their friends. I felt exhausted and overwhelmed with all of life's demands. I had a good husband, lots of friends, and a good church life, but none of that was working for me inside. I had believed in Jesus as a 17-year-old at a Young Life camp. If you know about Young Life, you come into the kingdom thinking, oh, I got to have Jesus. I got to have him. And I laughed my way all into the kingdom because at a young life camp, they are very funny. And that attracted me. And the commitment was to Christ was still there in my 30s. But I did not have any power to be the person I hoped to be. None. My closest friend invited me to a Bible study fellowship class. And she said it would be good for my children, but she was worried about me. 
And so I started reading the Bible, and I finally discovered the name and the purpose of the guest in my back room. It was and is the Holy Spirit who had entered my life as a teenager. And he was in my life, but he was never consulted and never invited to do anything. He, he was there. I'm sure he was going, why doesn't she talk to me? Why doesn't she use me? Why doesn't she even thank me? So I learned from the Bible how unconditional God's love is for each person. And why Jesus said that even when he went back to heaven, remember, he said he'd send another Jesus, just like himself, to be with us forever. That's the Holy Spirit. I read it, I studied it, it went right over my head. All right, the Spirit comes. He encourages us to tell him every detail of our lives. He actually gives us a desire to read and obey the Bible. And some of you have told me, the Bible just doesn't do anything for you. Just pray and ask the Spirit to liven it up. He will do it. Okay, open the door and start a lifelong conversation. That's what I do all day long. Back. Well, what do you think? And I'm not mentally ill. I'm really not. Okay. <laughs> Let him into every area of your life, even the really yucky stuff. We all have yucky stuff that we don't even want to think about. Holy Spirit wants to get hold of it and not make it yucky anymore. You will be like me forever thanking Jesus that he sent the guest into your life. And then, last step, change the guest to a resident that you talk to every day and all day long. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, you give us everything we need in life. And I thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we get to stand now, if you can. We're going to sing all hail the power of Jesus' name. One, three, and four.
So we're going to have silent prayer now. That means not out loud, but you know you're talking to God in your mind and heart, right? So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for the unity that we have in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. It's always good to, to be good because goodness comes from God. We just want you to be mindful that Jeanette is at the side of her dad as he is slowly making his transition out of this world. And uh, we also got a call this morning from Doug Leonard. He had to rush his wife to the hospital. Um, she may be having uh, sepsis or s some other condition that uh, the doctors have to really uh, tend to. And um, we also want to remind you of uh, the fact that we really need each other. We really do. We really need each other and we need to affirm our love for one another because these are some challenging days that we're living in. And without the prayers of the righteous that avails much in the sight of God, 
where would the wicked stand if the saints are not praying and travailing in prayer? So we bring you greetings from God's throne room this morning, and we anticipate each and every person experiencing the presence of God in their lives as we gather in the name of Christ. Let us pray. Father God, we lift up these prayers and these concerns and we pray not only for the petitions that we have spoken. We pray for Barbara Knight and we pray, Lord, there is so much sickness among us, so many afflicted among us. But Father, we thank you for the word of God that says you bring us out of our afflictions. You bring us out, Lord, and Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will bring your children out of afflictions because we know that we have many, but you deliver us from them all. And Father, we pray that you will speak into our lives and that we will receive the engrafted word of God with gladness. And Father, as you've taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Aren't you glad that the Lord is here? Let us sing together. Because they can't read, you know. Um, we're supposed to, if, he, if you can stand, do, otherwise, just be seated. But I wanted to say, it's a privilege to be up here because I look out here and I see answered prayer everywhere. We have this wonderful prayer group, and you can sign up for it. And I'll tell you, <laughs> I see what makes me almost cry because the prayer, and I know last week with Bernie here, just thank you that we know how to pray. And now we're going to sing together all creatures of our God and King, and it is verses 1, 2, and 5. And verse 5, the verse 5 that we'll sing is actually on the back.
Let us stand for the doxology. Father God, we lift up our hearts with thanksgiving and praise. And Father, we pray as we receive this offering, may it be used for the furtherance of your kingdom. We ask you to bless those who have given out of their abundance and those who have given out of their need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. I love when people respond. I ask you to praise the Lord, and I got a few people that heard and said, Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's an H bomb. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just want to remind you of um, one of the announcements and uh, recognize the floral arrangements that uh, the Dabrowski's. Uh, uh, gave us 
in memory of uh, Sig and uh, Gina Dombrowski, their, their parents, and uh, we're so grateful for that. Also want you to be mindful that we have five more spaces available for our Thursday uh, small group. Five more spaces you can sign up in the foyer, and also you need to get your book. And the study guide is Where Do We Go From Here by Dr. David Jeremiah. And uh, we are preparing for our October revival and renewal. It's going to be fantastic. God is uh, putting something on our hearts. And uh, you can begin now by praying. And for those of you who are spiritual, you can begin to fast too. And for those of you that are not spiritual, uh, you can fast too and pray that uh, God will bless us as we uh, gather together to remember what Jesus has uh, done for our lives. And the office will be closed tomorrow. And um, happy Memorial, happy uh, Labor Day. It seems like every day is a Labor Day. But uh, anyway, they've put, set aside a special day for recognition of that. Uh, we want to continue um, concluding our message in uh, living with conviction. Not living to be convicted or not living because you are convicted, but living with conviction. That means that there are certain things that you have determined that you're not going to do and that you're not going to allow to happen in your life because you have decided that you can put up a defense that the enemy is only going to go so far in your life. You're not going to allow him to deceive you and to take advantage of you and lead you down a path of destruction. I said a lot. We are dealing with Paul's letter to the Philippians. I want you to know that God knows how to deal with your enemies. He knows how to deal with those who are causing you problems. God knows how to take your enemy and turn your enemy upside down and right side out and do the things that you are doing trying to promote the kingdom of God. And this is what happened with Saul. He was determined to make havoc of God's church. And he had received authority and the right to lock up people and put them in jail and even pronounce death. But he met Jesus on his way, trying to bring the people of God into captivity. And as a result of that, his encounter with Jesus, he was a different person. So we're seeing here in this chapter of Philippians, as he wrote to the Philippian church to encourage them, to give them instructions in righteousness, and he is saying to them that he is in a place where he wants to go to heaven, but he is also feeling the pull to stay and remain to continue the ministry that God has called him to do. So he is at a place where he is trying to decide whether I should go and just relinquish what I've been doing because you know and I know that Jesus saved him but Jesus also told him that you're going to have to suffer for what you've done. Because the law of reciprocity is always at work. Hello? So we can bless people or we can curse people. Understand, when you curse people, the curses are coming back. Hello, somebody. When you bless people, 
the blessings are coming back. That's the way it works. So be careful who you and be encouraged for those that you because we have the power to bless or curse but know that what you sow is what you reap. So Paul had to sow what he reaped in the life of trying to destroy the church. And in verse 24, he is saying in Philippians, in, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 24, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Now he's not talking about when we talk about people being in their flesh. That means that they're doing things that are contrary to the will of God. He's not saying that I want to remain in the flesh to do things contrary to the will of God, but that I want to remain in the flesh to do the will of God. And I am at a crossroads whether I want to proceed because you know that he endured a lot. We shared with you some of his sufferings. We shared with you how he was in prison and how he was beaten and how he was stoned almost to death and left out at sea. But God raised him up. Each and every situation that he found himself in, God delivered him from. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers us, doesn't he, from them all. Every single affliction that we have, we're delivered from them, whether through this life or whether from the life to come. We are delivered because of God's word is true. Now, Paul has had to suffer for Christ's sake. Sometimes we suffer for our sake. Hello? Because the law of reciprocity is at work. Whatever you sow is what you reap. You don't care for your body, well, you're going to reap something. You don't watch what you eat, well, you're going to reap something. Because the law of reciprocity is always in effect. We can't get away from it. We can't escape it because it's a law that God has established. And Paul is saying, well, I am suffering for Christ's sake because when Christ called me, he says, I'm going to show you what you're going to have to deal with. I am going to use you, but you're going to have to suffer for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of communicating the word of God to people that don't want to hear you, to people that want to kill you. You see, because he turned his back on his old life. And those who supported his old life, they were pretty upset because he decided to follow Jesus. Imagine that. Imagine being persecuted for following Jesus. But they were after him. And even those who were Christians who came to Christ, didn't believe him. They thought he was a spy. They thought that he was using Christianity to get to them. And so he had difficulty even preaching to the people that God sent him to preach to and to deliver. So he was being rejected from both sides. But yet he remained faithful and true to his calling. Hardships. And his longing to be with Christ, he experienced that in his body. But he yielded to God's will to continue ministering. Sometimes when you are in affliction and the affliction doesn't seem to taper off, you come to a place where you say, well, Lord, get me out of here. Lord just, just, Lord, just come and get me, Lord. I'm ready, but you're not ready. You, you're ready to be delivered, but you're not really ready to be with the Lord. 
You just want to get out of that pain, out of that misery. And I can imagine that Paul just wanted to get a release from the misery of persecution and afflictions. Let me give you a little secret here. Someone has stated that a Christian, a Christian is immortal. You as a Christian are immortal until you die. Hello. You see, the devil can't kill you. The devil cannot kill you. Is this a revelation for someone? The enemy cannot kill you because you are a child of God and you're on mission for advancing the kingdom of God and all of his weapons cannot kill you. Who holds life and death in their hands? Does the enemy? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The one that holds life and death in his hands is Jesus. Come on, somebody. You're slow this morning. You must have been out too late last night or something. The only person that holds life and death in their hands is Jesus Christ. So no weapon formed against you by the enemy will prosper. I need an H-bomb. No weapon formed against you will prosper because the Spirit of God is within you and the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than that's in the world. And if Christ be for you, if God be for you, if God is for you, what enemy can overwhelm you? Not even death. Oh, oh, not even death can overtake you and overwhelm you. God has numbered your days. He's numbered all of our days. And we're not leaving here until he says so. Hello, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So no matter how weak, no matter how afflicted you get, you keep doing the will of God, and he'll get you out of here. Right on time. Amen. Praise the Lord, somebody. <laughs> Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. See, our works were not good until we became born again. Oh. Our works were no good until we became born again. Because our works, when we were not born again, they, they may have been looked upon as good by some standards, but they were works of the flesh and not of the Spirit. Am I going too deep for you this morning? For we are his workmanship created. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? An old creature? He is a new creature. So being in Christ, God creates new works. Works of everlasting works in us. Because we are his epistles. For good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We walk in the good work that God has called us to do. It's a good work. For those of you that bring cookies and coffee, it's a good work. It's a good work. Everything that's pertaining to Christ and the kingdom, it's a good work. For those of you that volunteer and greet people, and, and put the bullets, bullet, bulletins together, and operate the camera, and play the music, and do the singing. It's a good work. It's a good work. You are blessing us. You are blessing each other by doing it 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't become weary. Well, I don't know why they just have to have cookies all the time. Your cookie could save somebody, praise the Lord. <laughs> Hello. You see, when you are spiritual, you pray over all things. Lord, I bless these cookies this morning. May somebody come to know you through these cookies. Now, that sounds like foolishness, doesn't it? But it works. Prayer and faith and believing, that cookie can cause a person to have a conversation and, and come to Jesus. Hello. God takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. As we fulfill our commission from the Lord and finish faithfully serving and sharing his grace with the body of Christ and the world, then we can rest. After we finished our responsibility, then we can rest when we have walked and di di uh, done all the good works he prepared for us from the foundation of the world, he will say, son, daughter, it is time to come. Welcome home, my good and faithful servant. But until then, let us work while we have the energy, the mentality, the flexibility to do the things that pertain to God's everlasting kingdom. Verse 25, he says, I'm convinced of this. I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. What makes me excited is when I see people growing in their spirit. In their spiritual maturity, I get excited when people get excited about what Jesus Christ has done and is doing in their lives. They seem to glow. They seem to beam with, with enthusiasm and, and joy. And, and you could see the peace of God in their hearts because of what has transpired in their lives. They become younger. Hello. They become younger because they are being renewed by the joy of the Lord. And I'm so grateful that I learned a long time ago that the joy of the Lord is really my strength. When I don't have joy, I'm, I'm you know, I'm useless. The joy of the Lord is my strength, and I know how to get the joy of the Lord. Sometimes we may feel... We have done all we can do and can do and are ready to be with the Lord. And Paul probably felt that, well, I've done all that I can do and, and, and maybe it's time for me to leave, Lord. And then the Lord speaks to his heart and he says, I'm not done with you yet. It's not about you. It's about them. It's about them. It's not about you. And God delivered him every time, every time. And God will deliver you and I every time for the purpose of expanding his kingdom. It's in those times you conclude that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. Every week I have a feeling like, oh, this is going to be the last week. Have you ever felt that way? Huh? Some of you, maybe. I feel that way. I'm at my, you know, I'm at my boxing weight. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So I've lost a few pounds because I've, I'm eating less and enjoying it more. So I, I know some of you are concerned, well, you know, it looks like he's lost some weight. Yes, I've lost weight. I'm at my boxing weight. Praise God. I'm at my fighting weight. Hallelujah, somebody. I'm excited about what God is doing, not only in my life, but 
I am excited about what God is doing in your life, and you give testimony to what God is doing. And I love to hear your testimonies, and you share your experience with, with all of us here. We profit by that. While in prison, he knew that, God, that if God wanted him to continue strengthening the churches, he would be set free. God wants to continue what he started in your life. He doesn't want you to get to the finish line and says, well, you know, I just give up. And sometimes the blessing is just right there. It's just right there. And we get right there and we just say, well, I guess it's never going to happen. And all we have to do is take another step. Oh, wow. Praise the Lord. Look at, look at God. Look what he did. Oh, my goodness. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. Some people won't take a move until they see it. I got to see it before I can believe it. And then some people see it and still don't believe it. Verse 26, God was continuing to use Paul. Paul realized that as long as God restored his joy, Amid all that he endured, he would see believers maturing and continuing to minister to them. His work for the Lord precedes his desire to be with the Lord. Your work for the Lord precedes, precedes what you want. It's all about Lord not my will. Let your will be done in my life. That other people may come to know you through what I have to go through. Praise God. So some of us are being blessed abundantly through our afflictions. Oh, you don't see it. But other people are watching other people are listening. Other people are observing. And people are being blessed as you go through your struggles. And they're listening. Well, you know, I know I got to go through this, but I thank the Lord. And they look at you. Why do you thank the Lord for that? Because you learn in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. So you are thanking God all the way through your times of affliction. Because you know God is working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And sometimes through afflictions, we get a little tender, we get a little humbler, or sometimes through afflictions, people can get bitter, angry, mad, and nobody can comfort them. But God is helping us as we mature. Verse 26 in closing. Give me an H bomb. Hallelujah. He's closing the text. Praise the Lord Jehovah. So that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, in me, in my afflictions, in my example, in my ministry, you may have ample reason to glorify Jesus Christ because you have seen and heard the testimony that I've given you concerning what Jesus is doing in my life and how he is ever present. While he was in prison, prayers were being directed to the Lord for his release, and if we were released, he would rejoin them. This would continue to bolster their faith and joy for elevating their testimony of the Lord's faithfulness in answering prayers. I love when God answers prayers. Hallelujah, somebody. I love it when God answers prayers. 
Even when the situation seems so bleak and so dark and so hopeless and God comes in, hallelujah, praise God. That bolsters my faith in him, not in my ability, but in his faithfulness to answer the cry of his children. It gives us more reason to pray. It gives us more reason to look to him. This would continue. They would boast in the Lord and be faithful and thankful for Paul's return to strengthening and encouraging them to look to Jesus Christ. And we're coming into a, a realm of decisions. Decisions, government decisions. And I'm looking to the one who has all the answers. I'm looking at my word, praise the Lord. Because you measure a person by the word of God. And every tree will bear its fruit. You know, the devil is still a devil. The devil is still a deceiver. The devil is still a liar. Oh, it's not going to be that bad. Oh, that, that fruit looks good. Oh, it's going to give you everything you need. You're going to be just like God, knowing good and evil. And here we are. Here we are. We're dying. He would instruct them, Paul would instruct them be, to, uh, to become, uh, Paul would instru instru instruct them in becoming and allowing their experience to glorify God. In chapter 4, verse 13, he says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. He had to come to that. He had to have situation after situation in his life so that he could say, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. That leaves nothing that we cannot do. Nothing that we cannot endure because of Christ strengthening us to be more than we are, more than we can perceive ourselves to be. Paul was at peace with his circumstances because he didn't rest his hope on their prayers or petitions alone for the authorities to release him, but he looked to God. Your application, the Lord will renew our strength and empower us and our weakest hour to share his work. And I know this to be true. I know this to be true. Because as I was in the hospital, my testimony was directed toward the Lord. And I had nothing but love and praise to give those who came in my room and encourage them while I was recuperating and recovering. You see, the spirit of the living God is in you for good. And it's not about how you feel, but it's who you hope for and where your hope is. Where's your hope today? Application number two, we can always be assured that God's word sown in faith will be fruitful. Oh, hallelujah. Instead of looking at the situation that you're facing as bleak, whatever you're facing as bleak, just begin to say, Lord, be magnified in my life that other people may come to know you. And I tell you the joy that will overtake you is incredible hallelujah somebody incredible and then when you sing that song it is joy unspeakable and full of glory all the chandeliers are going to shake because it will be true to you you sing what is true to you and it's heartfelt, 
and people can feel it. You sing not just because you sing the words, but you sing because it's true to you. And if it's true to you, it's going to affect someone else that's around you. Let us pray. Father God, we are so grateful that we have ears to hear, that we have eyes to see, Lord, that we have a heart that beats and longs to breathe. Father, we are so grateful that we have eyes to look upon each other's continents and see hope and see joy and see life and have life more and more abundant. Father, we pray for those who are standing or sitting in the valley of decision. We pray that you will direct them toward Jesus, who is our hope, who is the person that allows us access into your throne room. We praise you, we bless you, we thank you, and even that nagging noise that's in the background, we bless you and the person that holds that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In everything, give thanks.